Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Costaville. I'm ASME's Executive Director and CEO. And I'm pleased to welcome you to ASME's inaugural virtual congressional briefing. We're excited to be able to connect with all of you, both on Capitol Hill and in this new format. Uh, as many of you, I'm sure, uh, my life has become some type of a video meeting 24-7. Uh, but here we're today to discuss an important issue that's affecting the future of the pandemic response in the US. Uh, specifically, we'll talk a little bit about how ASME and Manufacturing USA programs are working hard to ensure we come out of this pandemic more resilient. And I can trust you from my conversations, there's many, many people all on the same page. It's very, very comforting. As a trusted source of expertise and information, we are proud <clears throat> to host this event and remind you that just because we're working remotely doesn't mean and doesn't should not continue to research <clears throat> excuse me, new ways to support you. In this new era of social distancing and upheaval of routine, having a robust manufacturing industry is more imperative than ever. From addressing the shortages of protective equipment for essential workers to identifying new vaccines and ways to keep us healthy over the long term, the US manufacturing industry plays an integral role in ensuring our world post COVID-19 is a safe, and most importantly, a sustainable one. ASME convenes uh, these types of events uh, to provide policymakers and interested parties with information from subject matter experts in key technical areas. We believe it's important to show that these developments and what they mean to the future of our economy, our workforce, and most importantly, our collective quality of life. We're honored today to be joined by two of the Manufacturing USA Institute leaders uh, not just in the pandemic response, but in bolstering America's manufacturing across the board. Also with us is one of our ASME staff members who's been very active in the COVID-19 uh, crisis and also the ability to connect individuals to do more for, for, to re, for get to resolution. I wanna thank you. Uh, I want you to know that ASME is here to support you. And through your, <clears throat> through, I'm having one heck of a time today because of my allergies and I apologize. Uh, <clears throat> I also look forward to connecting again with many of you in person because they really truly enjoy our, uh, our events in Washington, DC. With that, Ann, I'll go back to sneezing and choking here. I'm, I'm not sick. It's the oak pollen, oak pollen here in Texas that's got me today. But thank you all for joining us. I look forward to the, uh, the next hour. Ann? Great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I want to uh, echo Tom's remarks and thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we are joined, as Tom mentioned, by a panel of three esteemed speakers who all bring a unique yet important perspective to our topic of discussion today. Our first speaker is Mr. John Wolzinski, Executive Director of America Makes. America Makes plays a pivotal role in bolstering U.S. 3D printing and additive manufacturing capabilities, and they are now leveraging their knowledge and expertise in bringing together key government agencies and leading experts in the fight against COVID-19. Our second speaker is Mr. Kelvin Lee, Institute Director of the National Institute for Innovative Manufacturing for Biopharmaceuticals, more colloquially known as NIMBLE. Through their work in biomanufacturing, NIMBLE has played an essential role in bringing together life-saving technologies to the market. Our third speaker is Ms. Christine Riley, Senior Director of Strategy and Innovation here at ASME. Engineering capacity is a key pillar of manufacturing, and with a membership base of over 100,000, ASME is uniquely positioned to bring together key players and industries in response to events such as the pandemic, while also serving as a thought leader as we look to push the boundaries of what is possible. So with that, just a couple of very quick housekeeping notes. Please hold all your questions until the end. We're going to do a great uh, large Q&A with everyone at the very end. We're going to be using the Q&A function. So if you have any questions, just type in your question. You can direct it to a specific panelist. Uh, and with that, I'm excited to turn. Oh, and also, you are being recorded. Just we're going to record this for um, purposes for everyone to be able to use as a resource following the event. So with that, I'm excited to turn it over to Mr. John Wolzinski, Executive Director of American Makes. Unmute. All right. Thank you so much, Anne. Can you give me permission to share? It says I cannot share. You should now be able to share, John. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry about that. And where did it go? Sorry, too many windows open. We 
All right, so hopefully everyone can see my screen now. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about some of the efforts that we've taken on at America Makes, um, talk you through our response to date, where we're at with things, how we got started in this, and then maybe most importantly, talk through how we feel the Manufacturing Innovation Institutes can be better positioned to help in supporting future crises as they may, or we certainly know will come up. So just to give you a quick overview uh, of America Make, so, so we are the Additive Manufacturing Innovation Institute. We're a Department of Defense uh, Innovation Institute. We've been working at this for almost eight years now. This summer will be in our eighth year. Um, we've worked very closely with a number of partners on the phone, uh, especially ASME. They've been with us really from the beginning. Um, but our, our real core function, and, and all of the institutes serve this function, but across different uh, advanced manufacturing technologies, is to organize a community. And, and we really see our, our biggest opportunity is to help lead in the communication, convening, and coordinating of the additive manufacturing ecosystem. And we've been working on that for years, and, and we've really now started to hone our focus specifically as it relates to the COVID-19 crisis. We've developed something called AMCPR, which we're calling the Advanced Manufacturing Crisis Production Response. And it's really the initiative that we've been working on for the past, I guess this is week seven now that we've really been um, diving headfirst into how do we ensure that the folks who are trying to help, which there are many, are as well organized as possible and are enabled to deliver safe and effective products. That's really what we're all trying to accomplish at the end of the day. And we wanna make sure that we're providing as much uh, means as possible in order to get people in a well position to do that. We were um, set up with some uh, initial funding by OSD, that is the organization that we work with, um, being a DOD institute to, to really help us get this in initiative started. Um, we, we started you know, seven or so weeks ago by reaching out to members, trying to figure out how we can help. Everyone wanted to help, but we weren't exactly sure how to help. So we, we came together, uh, put together a plan, and really started working closely on driving collaboration within our industry to help best support the crisis. And, and we thought our opportunity to do that was really through understanding demand, understanding capacity, and, and maybe most importantly, ensure we're, we're focused on a vetted design so that people are working on the, the right product. So I'll talk a little bit more about our relationship uh, with some of the federal agencies uh, as we go through the slides. If we look through the current state of where AMCPR is, you know, we, we got out of the gate very quickly. Um, honestly, it all really started for us um, you know, back in March, uh, a couple days into our uh, shelter in place activities. And we reached out to a number of members that led to more discussions, which ultimately led to reaching out to federal agencies, asking a, a laundry list of questions and, and really, you know, documenting for our membership and for the community at large, concerns that we had about lack of a um, trusted repository for data, lack of an understanding of demand signals, um, lack of vetted and evaluated designs. And there was a, a series of different items that were created. So through this response, we ultimately worked through the development of the system uh, that we're calling AMCPR. We initiated and created a portal. Uh, so that lives today on our website and it's active and, and hundreds of, of folks have come and signed up as either a manufacturer, as a someone from the needs community, or the third group is someone from the design community. And there's a couple of different workflows that we've been putting a lot of energy in. Um, I, I think the key uh, enabler to this was our partnership or collaboration is probably the best word between the FDA, the VA, and NIH. Uh, so there's a formal MOU that's in place between the government organizations. Um, you know, we've been working very closely from day one. Uh, I actually called them out specifically in a letter that I had submitted uh, of needing to establish a 
excuse me, needing to establish a process. Um, you know, we, we've been talking for weeks about what this process is, so I won't spend a lot of time digging into that, but really it's been this connection to these organizations that has enabled us to create a repository of evaluated and tested designs that can be used as community use items or in clinical settings. And there's a number of different uh, product that fall into that category. You know, we had very early on within days of getting established, we had hundreds of manufacturers across most of the states. You know, we were able to connect, you know, a hundred plus thousand pieces of, of PPE uh, requests to, main, you know, between the needs community and the manufacturing community. You know, so the stats that are on the right-hand side of the page are, you know, really stats from the first week and a half excuse me, week and a half of activity. Uh, there's many more designs in process. We've been, you know, on a daily basis meeting with FDA, VA, and NIH for the last seven weeks. It's been a, a fantastic relationship. The, the folks that are working that on, you know, the government side are tremendously dedicated, working through very complex problems. But we've been able to help coordinate that industry and even reach out to a number of other agencies who are trying to get involved and, and really show their support to get to the point where we have evaluated designs that we know the community can use. So we're, we're continuing to mature that. We wanna make sure whether you're a, a manufacturer that's familiar with the healthcare space or someone who is not, you very quickly understand where you can enter the market and where it makes sense for you to engage and, and what those rules of engagement are. So, so I could talk for, you know, couple hours about that, but we certainly don't have time. If there's questions about any of this, we're, we're very interested in talking outside of here. Um, there's a way too complicated um, diagram on the screen right now. And it really just talks to how we're prioritizing products. Uh, so we've gone through, we initially based our entire um, matrix on the FEMA uh, emergency needs list then quickly down selected that to items that can be printed or make sense to print. We worked through that very closely with the VA and FDA. And then we started to look through a process of, you know, prioritization by demand, by manufacturing process, by regulatory criteria, you know, ultimately led to different prioritization. Um, and those buckets, you know, it's been amazing how quickly those priorities have shifted. So some of the things that maybe are in tier four right now, in the last couple of days have skyrocketed to what is top priority. So I won't belabor this slide much. You know, this is really about communicating. There is a tremendous amount of, you know, thought that has gone into this process and there's many, many folks, you know, working together on this. So, so that's kind of a quick recap of, of some of what we've been doing. So we've seen, you know, a great opportunity to, leverage what we're learning right now in this current COVID crisis to create a national infrastructure and a capability that can better prepare the United States for future crises. We know they're going to come. We don't know whether it's going to be a natural disaster, a cyber attack, a terrorist attack, or another health crisis, but we certainly know they're coming. And we, we see a tremendous opportunity to take advantage of what we're all collectively working on right now but the key is making sure that we're organized. That's one thing I think we've learned. We, we're talking a lot about after action reports and those kinds of things. And there's tremendous value in, in looking back at what we've gone through. So we've gone through, <clears throat> excuse me, a rapid response phase. We, we've, we've developed some of that capability. There's plenty more to be done, but we've, we've done some of that. We've, we've worked like many on convening the ecosystem, um, but there's a tremendous you know, opportunity of what can be done still in this current crisis, as well as in, in future crises and in better preparation as a country um, around scaling capability, creating a resilient supply chain at all levels, meaning local or regional, state and federal, um, and then making sure that we're exercising this capability. So we know we've got to build a much more robust digital infrastructure to manage this ecosystem, manage the capabilities, you know, as difficult as it has been to create and get designs that have been vetted, that's been the easy part of the problem. You know, getting the supply chain organized and activated 
is, is really where we need to um, develop capability and then ultimately exercise that. So we've, we've got a lot of ideas on where this needs to go, um, learning from where we've been uh, in, the, in the past you know, month and a half. Uh, we feel that a development of a roadmap and, and really the playbook maybe more importantly, so roadmap so we know how to invest properly, a playbook so we understand how and the steps that need to be put in place in different pieces of, you know, whether that's government or on industry side, you know, how do we work together to work through that? Certainly feel there is a need for a model repository at some level. We have leveraged a, uh, a collection of models that has been available uh, through NIH. We, we've actually worked with them on, on another project. That's how we were familiar with them. And it made sense for this current health crisis. Um, I, I think the key takeaway for us is we need to make sure that this is something that's trusted by those who are going to use it, including you know, business, government, et cetera. We need to make sure it doesn't depend on a specific crisis. So we, we, as I mentioned, know this is going to be diverse over the years. And this may have been a once in a lifetime. Hopefully that's the case. But we certainly know there will be other crises that we should be better prepared for. You know, at this point is really where I think Manufacturing USA Institutes and the public-private relationships that our, our organization, that Kelvin, that Nimble, and, and all of the other institutes have developed puts us in a really good position to amplify and, and really, maybe most importantly, excuse me, coordinate our message. So from our point of view, what's needed, you know, we, we've really seen that, you know, there's, there's been a lot of attention provided to different emerging technologies over these past couple of years. One that has actually proven its role in providing a critical response to this crisis has been additive manufacturing. Um, others have played a role, certainly, but additive has squarely stepped up and proven its capability from prototyping to bridge manufacturing to ultimately, you know, becoming a, you know, quote unquote, conventional process that can be used to manufacture different types of product that are needed. Uh, so there's tremendous opportunity, but we have to develop a national strategy on how we're going to make sure we are driving the technology and ultimately becoming, you know, not just competitive within the US, but ultimately the global leader here, build a robust R&D strategy around advanced and additive manufacturing, and then ultimately leverage these public private partnerships that we have in place. We have tremendous resources available, we need to make sure that they're well organized and ultimately positioned properly. Uh, so this, this is just a quick takeaway. I'm sure these will be made available. Um, that's my email address. You know, we have a couple of different sites that you can connect to. Um, certainly interested in continuing the conversation. We have a lot more ideas about, you know, potential legislation, et cetera, that aligns back to some of those topics of what is needed next. Uh, so happy to discuss that with anyone who might be interested. So appreciate um, the opportunity and appreciate ASME coordinating all of this activity. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, and with that, we're going to kick it off next to Nimble. Kelvin, we're excited to hear what Nimble's been working on. Great. So uh, appreciate uh, ASME uh, organizing this activity and um, uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you today. I'm going to just start with a, a couple of slides on uh, context for who Nimble is for those who aren't familiar and then uh, cover a little bit about how Nimble has been responding and then also close with some policy thoughts uh, and considerations uh, moving forward. Uh, our, our Nimble mission is uh, to accelerate biopharmaceutical manufacturing innovation, as well as support the development of standards for more efficient and rapid uh, manufacturing capability, as well as educate and train a world leading workforce. Now, our, our mission space is really uh, medicines where biology is critical uh, to the manufacturing of those medicines. So it includes things like recombinant proteins uh, and antibodies. It in includes uh, vaccines. It includes things like cell and gene therapies. And I'm not going to carry you through the whole slide, but uh, just for context, uh, we, we think that Nimble can play a really important role, not only in our global competitiveness around uh, manufacturing, but certainly in uh, onshoring uh, of, of uh, biopharmaceutical manufacturing and supply chains, uh, as well as in uh, helping secure supplies of medicines in response uh, to public health threats. 
we, we count about 140 members currently that is large and small industry universities and community colleges. And we've been uh, very fortunate to have um, substantial engagement uh, across a wide cross section of federal agencies. Uh, NIST is our sponsor agency in the Department of Commerce, uh, but also we have uh, very deep engagement with the FDA, uh, NIH, uh, DOD, and uh, others. Uh, this uh, focus area is just uh, reflects, uh, again, what I mentioned before, where biology is critical to the manufacturing of medicine is really where uh, we find our primary expertise, uh, whether it's in existing products like vaccines and therapeutic proteins or antibodies, as well as in some of the newest uh, modalities that are coming to market in more personalized medicines, uh, cell therapies, and uh, gene therapies. And the next slide is just a, a logo slide, just to give you a feel for the kinds of partners that we have. Uh, some of the bigger companies are listed closer to the top uh, and include uh, both uh, drug product manufacturers as well as large vendors and suppliers to the industry. We also have a very close relationship uh, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through an initiative we call the Global Health Fund. Uh, and then you can see the expertise and, and partners from uh, the rest uh, of our community. Uh, we, we've been pretty engaged in both some very specific activities as well as some broad ranging um, ecosystem uh, development and building uh, uh, activities. On this slide, I'm just trying to reflect uh, a few uh, specific examples of things that we have been working on as it relates to uh, COVID response. Uh, in this top example, uh, we engaged uh, with our own staff in, in a collaboration with the local hospital system uh, to develop a PCR uh, based diagnostic assay that, um, as, as you'll know from the news, is obviously uh, the first established diagnostic assay. But uh, in our case, we're trying to look for a way to rely on alternate supply chains and uh, equipment and infrastructure that uh, would uh, get away from some of the current concerns. Uh, and we were able to uh, recently validate a, a new test uh, that we think uh, is, is right now pending uh, emergency use authorization but we think uh, if authorized, uh, not only will this increase local testing capacity, but if you scale that out to uh, its uh, likely potential, uh, this could actually lead up to 500,000 tests a week potentially. So, uh, so it's, a, it's an exciting technology for us because uh, expanding supply chain, uh, the diversity of supply chains uh, to do testing we think is, is a critical need. In, in the second bullet point, um, one of our uh, members has been working um, on uh, powered air purifying respirators. They already are in this business uh, space with NIOSH certification for these, uh, uh, for this PPE. But uh, in response to uh, the uh, pandemic and, and the outbreak, uh, they've looked at uh, onshoring some of the supply chains, including updating a little bit of the design of, uh, of their technology uh, to rely more on commercial off the shelf components, uh, which is uh, accelerating their production capabilities. And, and their goal is uh, 10x uh, or greater uh, manufacturing capacity, which from what I understand, they are on, on target to achieve. The third example is uh, just uh, supply chain modeling uh, and looking at um, uh, how best to uh, address some of the supply chain constraints and issues. In, in our case, we're focused on um, testing. So that's both PCR-based testing as well as serological testing for uh, antibodies. Uh, and then the last uh, bullet point uh, is uh, you know, we, we're spending a lot of time thinking about uh, strategies and, and curriculum and content uh, to address what is going to be a very large number of students who are going to graduate, whether that's from high schools or from uh, colleges and universities who are going to graduate into a, a very deep recession. And, and how do you think about uh, using that as an opportunity uh, to offer some of the skills needed in uh, some of the, uh, the spaces that we work in, in terms of biopharmaceutical uh, manufacturing? Uh, one thing that we did was a community call to action to solicit ideas. Uh, you know, John mentioned with the America Makes and their initiative, you know, a, a powerful aspect of, of these institutes is, is around the ability to convene the ecosystem. And, and so we, uh, we dropped an email to our community with, uh, we were pretty tight lipped. We didn't actually send signals that we were going to do this. We, we dropped an email on Friday, April 3rd uh, at 1030 in the morning. Uh, asking for ideas and, and proposals from our community uh, and, and gave a two o'clock uh, that same day webinar about a process for potentially selecting some ideas and looking for uh, funding opportunities. And we set the deadline as the following Monday uh, at three o'clock. 
Um, we only uh, made this available because of limited resources to our Nimble member community, but we didn't limit the ideas to biopharmaceutical manufacturing uh, technologies. We, we opened it up more broadly and invited submissions on any topic that, that uh, Nimble subject matter expertise uh, could contribute to solutions. Uh, even in that one, on one business day turnaround time, we received over 200 submissions in response to our request. Uh, ideas led from small businesses, from large global companies, from universities and academic medical centers, from federal scientists and, and others. We're right now going through a process to try to finalize and understand which projects are going to be best positioned for launch and impact in a very short timeline. Um, but I, I wanted to reflect here, uh, so I can't tell you exactly which, what those projects are going to be just yet, but I want to reflect here the, the categories of ideas that, that came to our community. Uh, uh, and, and of course, they relate to testing, whether that's antibody testing, uh, PCR methods and others, uh, a significant al amount of expertise in contact tracing technologies for tracking people, for tracking equipment, for tracking manufacturing operations, uh, decontamination technologies, of course, uh, personal protective equipment, both development of new as well as just manufacturing and scale up. Um, and uh, as you might expect, a lot of uh, activity in, in medical countermeasures, both in, in discovery and development and manufacturing. And, and for us, uh, this is uh, small molecules, uh, as well as large molecules, as well as vaccines, plasma therapies and cell therapies, uh, a number of ideas in supply chain analysis and modeling, as well as financial impact forecasting, and then, of course, uh, a number in durable uh, medical equipment development and manufacturing, as well as some others. So we, we gathered far more ideas and, uh, and potential budgets than we could possibly uh, afford. But I, I think that really speaks to the enthusiasm that our community, and I don't think we're special amongst the Manufacturing USA Institutes, I think all of the members of, of these institutes, and I think it's around 2,000 strong, organizations that are members of one of these institutes, I, I think there is a strong will and a strong interest in trying to uh, help the nation move forward. Uh, so that, that has me you know, think a little bit about some policy considerations. On, on the right-hand side here, uh, you know, I, I just want to reflect that the institutes, uh, they span multiple uh, business sectors and ecosystems, and I think that's a real opportunity. Uh, it's a national network of organizations and individuals with different capabilities, different networks, different um, uh, expertise. Uh, the, the directors of the institutes uh, since this uh, outbreak have been uh, talking regularly. Every week we have a meeting, uh, we exchange ideas, we exchange information, and we start brainstorming you know, how we can, as an ecosystem uh, and a network, contribute to the national response, not only for COVID, but thinking about, as John reflected, I think importantly, the next crisis, which could be medical or it could be uh, in some other form, but what can we do to, to try to prepare the nation and who else needs to be parts of these conversations around manufacturing resiliency for our, for our country? Um, certainly the, the programmatic focus on domestic manufacturing uh, capability and supply chains is important. And, and I'll, at the bottom of that list on the right-hand side, just reflect that uh, you know, we do represent the interests of a lot of different agencies. And I think uh, that um, uh, is, is very important and critical uh, as you need a whole of government strategy to respond uh, to these crises. So we, we think about the institutes uh, as a vehicle uh, for uh, relying on these public-private partnerships to focus on domestic manufacturing capabilities uh, and to use these institutes as vehicles to support uh, response to a crisis uh, through manufacturing capabilities, as well as to potentially stimulate economic recovery moving forward. Uh, we, we would, you know, I think, argue that we uh, see value in supporting a uh, a longer term strategy to coordinate across agencies and business sectors uh, to help establish a more resilient manufacturing infrastructure. And, and we think that you know, there's a, a lot of value in the planning and preparedness uh, expertise that agencies have, uh, BARDA and as well as other agencies. Uh, you know, they, they play a quiet role when there isn't a crisis, but I think we see how important a role they can play uh, when, when a crisis uh, emerges. So with that, I'll, I'll close and, and thank uh, ASME again for hosting uh, the event and uh, and later on uh, towards the end, be happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks, Kelvin. That was wonderful. And now we're going to turn over to Christine to give us the ASME perspective. Christine, hi, Anne. Thank you so much again. Um, I really am thankful for having been invited to this call. 
And um, I'll just start off by saying that my name is Christine Riley. I'll introduce myself again. I'm the Senior Director of Strategy and Innovation for SME. And uh, ASME has also been organizing a response to COVID-19 uh, since early March. And really that response has been categorized into four major areas. Uh, the first is industry connections. Uh, the second refers to STEM education. The third focuses on academic research and the fourth pertains to government relations. So going into industry connections, um, one thing that ASME has been doing has been um, convening the community, really leveraging our strength as a neutral third party convener. In this case, we're bringing together those in the medical additive manufacturing and 3D printing space for weekly Zoom meetings. And at these meetings, we've been uh, bringing together folks from hospitals, manufacturers, uh, service providers, um, and other areas. And it's really been uh, an interactive, robust discussion every week where um, members of the community can even informally share some of the um, challenges they've been encountering and really come together with um, some brainstorming as, as how they can solve those challenges. Um, also, as uh, John Lachinsky mentioned earlier in this call, um, we've been working with America Makes. Um, in this case, ASME has been jumping into the fray by bringing its modeling and simulation community um, to the America Makes repository. So in this case, um, when designs are submitted and vetted through the FDA and the VA, um, our modeling and simulation experts have been coming in to take a look at which designs um, are likely to be approved. And then um, thirdly, ASME's market intelligence um, unit has been conducting surveys on a biweekly basis to really get an understanding of how engineers are being affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, and also um, to get a feel for how, um, how this is affecting not only their industry, but also their day-to-day -day jobs and how they likely um, are viewing the impact uh, days, weeks, and months from now. And finally, our mechanical engineering magazine continues to provide coverage just as it always has um, about the state of engineer the engineering industry. Um, in this case, um, every day we see a new article or video about COVID-19. Um, here on the screen, you'll see just a few screenshots of some of the articles and videos that we're providing. In the STEM education area, um, we're targeting students and lifelong learners at all phases of their career in education, starting with our Inspire program. This is an e-learning platform where students in grades four through 10 can have an interactive online experience in which they learn more about the types of engineering careers that are available and to which they may be suited. Um, moving along to the university students, ASME just hosted eFest Digital. Um, eFest is something that ASME has been hosting for a few years now live in uh, the US, India, and uh, Kenya, but um, due to the recent circumstances, uh, we pivoted to a virtual event this past Saturday, and it was really a huge success. We reached uh, more than 1,800 students from more than 45 countries, and we had talks broadcast via YouTube Live, and it was really quite a success. Uh, finally, we have ASME Learn From Home. This is for uh, engineers, postgraduates who can um, access e-learning courses at a deep discount. And again, for all these programs, we invite you to visit asme.org COVID, um, forward slash COVID-19. Thirdly, um, we are continuing to support the academic research community by making our journal articles and proceedings that are relevant to COVID-19 available online at no cost. And here you see some images from a journal article that's being made freely, uh, freely available and this journal article pertains to the design of a BiPAP mask. And finally, in our government, re government relations sector, um, you're here for this brief congressional briefing. And we also plan to issue a white paper addressing some of the supply chain concerns that Kelvin and John um, addressed, in their, uh, addressed in their talk. Uh, that white paper is going to be released uh, within the next week or two. And um, again, just to summarize, we have 
uh, four areas where ASME has been playing a major role, government relations, STEM education, academic research, and industry convening. And if we have any questions, I'll be happy to entertain those. Thank you. Great, thanks, Christine. And thanks to John and Kelvin as well for such informative presentations. So now to our attendees, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please send them to us using the Q&A function. We're ready to answer them. Um, but we're gonna actually kick off our Q&A with a question that we received prior to the event. And this question goes to you, John. Is there a need for additional technical assistance for manufacturers to figure out how to retrofit their production line in order to produce needed medical equipment? For some context, DOE has proposed providing this kind of assistance through its national labs, but it's unclear how much this technical assistance is needed. So some information on how this is being utilized to manufacturing USA would be helpful. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, we've certainly seen um, the need and opportunity there. And in some cases, there's been great examples. In other cases, there's a number of folks who are sitting back, you know, unsure of what to do next. And in many cases, there, you know, we've seen a, a wide variety of organizations from, you know, smaller shops to large manufacturers who aren't exactly sure what to do next or, you know, whether they respond to a, a DPA Title III or, you know, how to, you know, retool, for lack of a better term, their facility. And there's, you know, one of the things that we've run into more often than not, and admittedly, our, our team is not experts in the medical community like Kelvin's team is, um, you know, th this has been a, a learning experience for all of us. So one thing that we've tried to do is, is educate as much as possible and make things as clear as possible for folks. So there's certainly a need for investment in technical assistance. I think we, we have a great opportunity um, through things like what we're doing, what Nimble is doing, what many of the other institutes are doing through the public-private partnerships to coordinate that response. Um, DOE is, is certainly very capable, but I think it's, it's something where we need to make sure we're investing in diverse approaches, not necessarily doing one-off answers, although you know, in some cases those are, are certainly needed, um, but there's, there's a tremendous need to, to get these manufacturers who are extremely capable if they're just given the right information on how to, whether it's retool or if it's as simple as knowing how to label and package and, and, and make something available that they did produce available. You know, we've heard some, some stories of folks, you know, providing goods and then them not being used because they didn't follow a particular process. And, you know, ourselves and ASME, I've been on all of the weekly calls that they've had for, you know, a month plus now. Those kinds of things keep coming up. And that's from organizations who are, you know, in some cases very large and, and they don't know what to do. So there's, there's certainly a need for it right now, but maybe more importantly, as we try to figure out how to accelerate our recovery and readiness moving forward, you know, one of the things that we've, I'll say, are trying to promote is the need for more awareness in this space. So when the machine shop or injection mold facility comes to us and is plenty capable of retooling their line, but they don't know what to go do next, that's a problem. You know, that, that's not acceptable. And, and if we want to get to the point where we're taking advantage of conventional process, we need to be able to get them this technical assistance much more rapidly. And, you know, there's a lot of ways I think we can do that. But I guess the, the really long answer to the question is yes, um, more technical assistance is certainly needed. I think there's a role for all of us on the phone and, and many others to play, uh, you know, a lead in coordinating that response. Thanks, John. Uh, Kelvin, we're going to pivot over to, we have a question from ASME president. Uh, are you coordinated with FEMA? We have not coordinated with FEMA. We, we have uh, interactions with obviously the FDA, with uh, NIH uh, and NIST, but we haven't had those interactions yet. I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's an opportunity to um, uh, interact with them and, uh, and and ensure that what we're doing is part of a coordinated response, but we haven't yet made that connection. Great, thanks. And then a question from our YouTube channel. This, John, this is for you and also Kelvin a little bit. 
What about the manufacturers in the U.S. and abroad whose certificates are expired? How does that work for them? Sorry, I was reading the question. Um, the so I don't know that I know the answer to that. Um, certificates are expired, especially for pressure vessel manufacturers. So so it's 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 dependent on what kind of device or item that you're trying to produce. Ultimately, there are and that landscape has changed very rapidly over the past couple of months. And there's new guidance coming out regularly from FDA and, and other you know, regulatory bodies around who can produce what, what maybe relaxation in requirement or excuse me, regulatory um, advice has come through. So it, it's really dependent. Um, you know, in some cases, things have been relaxed to the point where you do not need GMP or good manufacturing practice. And don't necessarily have to fall under the ISO medical standard, and I'll let those of you that understand that better than I do, um, to have that in place. In other cases, that is absolutely not the case, and it is not going to change. So again, very dependent on you know the criticality of use is, is really what it is on. And that's why we're trying to make it as visible as possible if you come to, you know, in our case, the site to look at what designs are available, you can enter in and see, do I have these checks? Yes, I can make a face shield, absolutely. If I don't have this check, I cannot make a nasal swab. You know, there, there's things like that that we just have to be aware of and then gets certainly more complicated as the item gets more uh, critical. Thanks. Uh, Kelvin, I'm gonna turn your attention over to the Q&A box. We have a question from Bob Hawk. Um, if you could kind of give the answer to, you know, given the Nimble's mission to accelerate manufacturing innovation and given the debacle of the testing and tracing painfully slow, slowly ramp up, how do we not repeat the failure with the plan to ramp up capacity and distribution to scale vaccine manufacturing? Yeah, that, that's a really important and a really great question. So I, I think one of the, I think the direction when it comes to vaccines, uh, you, you know, obviously there, the number in the question is 350 million or more doses. That's assuming a single dose per American citizen. I, I think when you think about this globally uh, and you don't know if it's gonna be a single dose or maybe somebody has to get dosed twice, you, you're potentially talking about billions of doses. And, and I think this is where there is power in the private sector that uh, those companies that uh, do a lot of vaccine manufacturing uh, are used to the idea that they will have to prepare and make available that many doses. And, and in, inside this country, uh, the regulators are familiar and, and comfortable with the idea that uh, many, many millions of doses are going to have to be made available. The question is, how do you do it in a short period of time? And there, what I'm already seeing is uh, a lot of vaccine manufacturers, without even knowing if their vaccine is going to make it through clinical trials, they're already acquiring the ability to scale out manufacturing. They're acquiring uh, contract manufacturing capabilities. They're preparing, they're signing contracts. They're absorbing some of that risk. Uh, in the anticipation that their product will be available so that it can be made very quickly. But that really points to uh, perhaps a policy related issue, which is uh, that, you know, in normal times, companies normally wouldn't accept that kind of risk and they would wait. And that's part of why it takes a long time uh, to, to bring vaccines to market. An agency like BARDA uh, does have the ability to co-invest alongside private sector entities and therefore absorb some of that financial risk uh, to accelerate timelines. And that's where I think the federal government can play a role by de-risking some of these investments and allowing the companies to prepare and scale out their manufacturing and scale up the manufacturing as well uh, in, in advance of anticipating having a vaccine available. Great, thanks, Kelvin. Um, moving, we're just gonna skip over in the Q&A to a question that involves all three of our panelists. Uh, is there an easy means by which you're able to get your innovations into the supply chain? If so, how is it working? Could there be improvements? If not, what are your recommendations for rapidly transitioning new capabilities to the U.S. manufacturing ecosystem? Be curious to hear from all three of your perspectives since you all come from slightly different backgrounds. Uh, John, why don't we start with you? Sure. So we're we're focused on additive manufacturing. Uh, certainly, there's there's 
overflow into a number of different advanced manufacturing processes that we're very interested in. I think we're, we're getting pulled into. So the, the, it's a yes and a no for us. I would say the, the yes is there is certainly opportunity to get your ideas and inventions, if you will, into the supply chain. We have an entire process set up right now with you can post your item to the NIH site. It gets uploaded as a prototype. It then goes through an evaluation process, then gets down selected. Ultimately, we have um, the VA is doing the, the majority of that work. Um, recently, ASME has started to get engaged in that as well. So we've, we've, there's so many models out there right now. We're trying to shift some, you know, at, shift over to a more model based or I'll say simulation based approach to quickly review, down select, prioritize, and then push those items over to the VA for evaluation and testing. So there is a mechanism, if it is a printed component, to get it through the system. However, if it is related to a critical component, life-saving device or something like that, it, it still has to follow certain regulatory path through FDA. So um, there is opportunity. We have items out there that are posted. Uh, there are some EUAs in the works that have specifically called out open source approaches and posting on NIH that are being worked. Um, those are not in the position where they're completed yet. So that's the yes side of it. Um, there, there certainly are items that, you know, it, it's more difficult to get into the supply chain. And it really is, again, dependent on type of device. Um, for us, we have a process around printed components. How that transitions to conventional, you know, that becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, so hopefully that partially answered the question. Yes, thank you. Kelvin? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll echo what John said. I, I think you know, we are looking at the issue. We're starting to model the issue. I, I think uh, one of the things about Nimble, we're in a typically in an industry vertical. And, and so we can understand uh, the elements of the supply chain that are related to uh, the kinds of things that we normally work on. What we're seeing now in terms of COVID response is that we're, um, we're being pulled, our expertise is being pulled in directions that stretch beyond our initial vertical uh, because we have the expertise and capability and the connections to try to address those issues. And the further we uh, delve into this, frankly, the harder it is for me to, to fully understand how uh, the, the breadth and the depth of the impact we can have when it comes to supply chains and the reason I mention that is, uh, as we talk, as I talk to the other institute directors, I see that elements of that expertise across the institutes, whether it's the Smart Manufacturing Institute and their knowledge of sensors and, and how sensors could be communicating across manufacturers and suppliers, whether, whether it's uh, MXD in, in digital, whether it's uh, even remade on the sustainability end for, for thinking about life cycle. I, I think there's opportunities and expertise uh, across the institutes that, if brought together, uh, could really form, I, I think, a really deep, uh, rich knowledge base about how to most effectively um, uh, address some of the supply chain issues that we're seeing. Great, thanks. Christine, could you kind of provide a little bit of perspective about what ASME is doing in this area? Sure. Um, I'll just echo uh, John's and Kelvin's comments by saying that you know we have short-term and, and long-term views on this. Uh, for the short term, we have had some engineers, designers coming to ASME and expressing their interest in helping and providing their thoughts on various designs and new quote unquote inventions. Um, we have been directing those engineers to uh, the America Makes repository that John's been discussing because we really do see the need to provide a centralized location um, where those designs can be submitted. Um, Looking at the long term, however, um, ASME um, is going to convene its experts from many different verticals, from many different areas to really do a deep dive into lessons learned so that um, for future events, we can understand and propose ways to incorporate a greater degree of agility into the supply chain going forward. So um, we can institute new best practices um, in preparation for future events. Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on to a more policy-focused question, 
have any of you heard from federal agencies that you work with that they don't have the authorities they need that would have helped them? Um, in addition, have you found MEPs to be helpful? So again, we can kind of go down the chain. John, we'll start with you. So I, I don't, my immediate reaction would be no. And you know, being a DOD Institute, we've been working you know, outside of NIH and VA and FDA and that, and that channel. We have worked very closely with the DOD. Uh, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of resource available across, you know, the services, the labs, um, you know, test facilities, et cetera. And they have a tremendous need for equipment themselves. Um, so we've been very engaged with that community. There's been stood up a joint acquisition task force that we've been meeting with very regularly to make sure that we're leveraging each other. Um, as far as having the right authority or not, I think the thing that we've seen most is coordination and getting those folks that want to help, and this is no different than industry, connected back to those that are the regulatory owners is, is what's most important in, in Granite for the DOD. And I won't pretend to be an expert, but there are different, you know, you know MedCom and different things like that that exist within the DOD that work very closely historically with the FDA. So I think that has been, uh, it, it's worked well together. Uh, I, I can't identify any specific, somebody was, had a great idea and just didn't have the right authority to move forward with it. Um, I don't know enough about where we're at with DPA Title III and those kinds of things where we're no, there's been some very quick turn um, requests put in and they've got tremendous response from the community. Um, and I know they've taken action on a number of different things and started a conventional or I guess supplementing the supply chain with a lot of US manufacturers um, but I'm not close enough to it and don't have uh, insight into if, if there's things that they, they needed more authority on to better support. Kelvin, do you have anything else to add to that? I, I don't have a lot of specific uh, examples, but you know, I, I do think there's, there's questions and this is actually related to another, uh, my response here will be a little bit related to another uh, question that's been posed. Uh, around you know contracting mechanisms and awarding of federal financial assistance and the extent to which available contracting mechanisms can be used to just acquire, uh, uh, for example, uh, or, or help a for-profit entity just tool up and expand manufacturing capability versus to what extent is it uh, for a research or a development purpose. But I, I really haven't been involved in a lot of conversations around that. Um, but that is the only thing that has come into my sphere uh, that could be a, a contracting authorities uh, for some of the agencies. I uh, haven't heard anything else. Uh, I, I think the MEPs have been uh, helpful uh, on, on that other element to this question in that uh, there are a lot of small companies out there that are parts of the supply chain uh, and helping them ramp up as quickly as possible, uh, educating them and informing them. For example, John referred to a lot of the uh, regulatory issues that, that come into play for some of these medical products, uh, helping educate and inform them about what the issues are, uh, can accelerate their ability to, to get on board and scale up. Great, thanks. And Christine, I know you and I have worked pretty closely as I'm the government relations person at ASME and you're our head strategy person. Um, but kind of, I guess, from a more technical perspective, would you find that your engagement with manufacturing USA and any other federal agencies has run into any particular roadblocks or any areas that you find they would like some help going forward? Um, just from our perspective, um, really, you know, we've been working very closely, as I mentioned, with, um, you know, uh, we've been working with uh, America Makes in terms of the modeling and simulation connection to help vet some of those designs. Um, but really just, again, to echo Kel Kelvin's comments um, that we're seeing a need to um, perhaps educate um, engineers and designers out there about the requirements for submitting uh, a design or a product for approval in the medical space. So uh, helping them understand what FDA regulations, uh, the various classes, class one, two, and three, um, you know, just really providing that education to those in the engineering community has really been um, uh, really paramount here. Terrific, thank you so much. Well, keeping an eye on the time, uh, we wanna be re respectful of everyone's time. I would like to throw it back to 
all of our panelists just for some closing remarks before we end kind of what is a, something we all need to be aware of going forward um john we'll start with you okay perfect i i think and i kind of closed my couple of minutes and, and someone specifically asked about what do we need what new legislation would help you know how do we help address the stockpile so i'll, I'll try to couple of cover a couple of these things you know ultimately we need to focus on recovery and readiness those are the the two plays that we have right now and we need to make sure we're coordinated in our response and whether we play a role in that or don't it doesn't necessarily matter it's about making sure that we are able to recover quickly and are better prepared for the future ultimately supply chain resiliency has been our problem so there's a number of different funding opportunities out there that are trying to address these things we need to get some of these capabilities you know reshored and we understand that i think we understand that better than ever before uh, with this current crisis but ultimately you know my three closing points from before are creating a national strategy so how do we build a national strategy around for us additive manufacturing how do we make sure we're investing in that strategy. So we're using it as our tech investment strategy. And how are we leveraging those entities that exist, whether it's our organization as America makes, as you know, organizations like ASME and other standards body, there's a number of great resources out there. You know, we need to make sure we're convening, coordinating and catalyzing the industry collectively around the problem so that we can be better prepared for the future. Great, thanks, Kelvin. Yeah, I would actually echo a lot of those points. I, I think as we as we start to think about how to respond to the current situation, but also importantly prepare for the future, you know, I, I think that supply chain and manufacturing uh, capacity and capability resiliency uh, obviously has been exposed a, as an issue. Um, and and uh, and industrial policy is not something that we've ever really done as a nation. And I don't know that we need to go that far, but I think thinking about the framework that exists for the Manufacturing USA Institutes uh, as um, an infrastructure that can be built upon, uh, that relies not only on the federal government, but co-investment by the private sector, uh, relies on the expertise from the academic sector and other nonprofits, uh, and, and thinking about uh, a coordinated way, a more strategic vision for how we can invest uh, so that we frankly, have a more modest investment on a regular basis so that we don't have to make these massive investments in response to a crisis. You can't be prepared for every crisis, but I think we could, uh, I think it's fair to say we, we could have made a little bit more investment uh, and that might have uh, perhaps um, uh, lessened some of the impact, although I think the impact still isn't known uh, from the current crisis. But there is an existing framework in place that I think we could build from. Thank you, Christine. Um, I also agree with the points that both John and Kelvin made. Um, really understanding and learning from this current situation so that will allow us to prepare for future crises as they arise. Um, really taking those lessons learned, um, developing best practices, and also um, engaging uh, various disciplines across different industries and verticals. Um, just simply even having um, physicians work more closely with engineers and manufacturers so that we can um, uh, have a better response um, down the road. I'm also speaking from an engineering perspective and from ASME's perspective, we are looking at how um, new technologies, digital technologies such as AI and machine learning can be incorporated to make for a more robust supply chain uh, manufacturing operations down the line as well. So that's another area where ASME is focusing. Great, thank you. And before we close, I'd actually like to throw it back to Tom Costaville. Tom, do you have any words of wisdom for us to end on? And all I wanted to say was thank you to our panelists today and thank you for everybody for joining us today. It's an interesting time for, for all of us. Uh, I would offer one piece that I find <clears throat> that I found in the past navigating large companies through these types of crises. The one time, the one thing different this time is that this is global. All of the other the disasters that I was involved with were always local, but yet we had other parts of our operations that effectively 
supporting the rest of the enterprise. The one thing I would say is that when you communicate, please communicate with compassion. You've heard a lot of what engineers can do today. It's the compassion, it's the, the commitment to engineering excellence that makes us great. Kelvin, John, Christine, thank you guys. Uh, I'm proud to be part of the same team that you guys are on. And thank you for doing what you're doing. And and everybody else, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank great. you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and as it's clear to see, these conversations are just beginning. ASME wants to continue these conversations. We have several more briefings planned. We hope you will all join us as we have those briefings and continue these conversations. If you would like to reach out, if we did not get to answer any of your questions today, please be attached to the speaker's contact information and feel free to reach out to us. Thank you all so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks all.